Okay, we'll start over again. Oh, good morning. My name is Monique Sullivan, and I am the Continuous School Improvement Coordinator for the Maine Department of Education. And welcome to the October Tier 3 CSI Principal and Coach Meeting. And this is for schools that have been identified as Tier 3 and are receiving um, what we call Section 1003 or SIG funds. So again, just like with every meeting, we just want to go real quickly, the main Department of Education's mission and the strategic goals. And this is the driving force behind all the work that we do at the department. And today's objectives, we just have a few. I'm going to go real quickly over the year at a glance. And then two of our coaches, um, Amy Peterson Roper and Kim Schroeder, are going to talk about two guidance documents that we've created for our schools based on um, the needs our schools have expressed. Um, one of them on being how to select effective professional development and to understand how to select, select an outside consultant. And um, there will be hopefully some time at the end for any questions, but if you don't, if we don't have time or you the questions just come up as they as we think of them, just throw them in the chat and we will try to answer them as we can, or we'll definitely get back to you um, with those questions. So again, a year at a glance, we do have this in the memo of, of understanding that was signed back um, in August, September. And this just goes through each of the years, I'm sorry, each of the months. And we are on October. Um, we are talking about action steps, um, at selecting evidence-based interventions. Um, not sure if we're at the identified resource inequities, but uh, kind of along that same uh, trajectory. I just want to talk just real uh, quickly about the action step, the action steps, uh, they do need to be aligned with your evidence-based interventions that are addressing the identified growth areas, the root causes and resource inequities. We are working on some guidance for selecting evidence-based interventions and for identifying resource inequities. So those should be coming soon. And the rest of this presentation or this webinar is really to go over the two guidance documents that were created, um, one for selecting effective professional development and external consultants or outside consultants. So I am going to I'm going to run the slideshow, but um, Amy and Kim are going to start with the guidance documents. And I'm also um, I will try to put this in the chat, um, but they do have two uh, links to these documents as well. So uh, go ahead, Amy or Kim. Um, I'm going to start. So I'm Kim Schroeder and um, we got two, I gotta make sure uh, I have my view and that I know that the view that um, Monique's doing. Can you go to the next slide, Monique? Yes. There we go, okay. Hopefully I'm gonna be on the same page now. So this slide identifies um, strategic priorities that go along with what Monique just showed in a couple slides ago that the department has highlighted. And for this presentation, the one we'll be focusing on mostly is the one that is highlighted in yellow, which is providing information, guidance, professional learning, and support to schools and educators. Um, can you go to the next slide? So as what Monique said, um, the coaches, we've been working probably since last spring on various guidance documents. And the one I was involved in with uh, three other colleagues was what is professional development and, and how to give better guidance to the schools when they're reviewing professional development opportunities and to pick the most effective ones. And in doing this, we reviewed many documents highlighting recommended effective professional development practices and looked for commonalities. However, we mainly relied on the work of Linda Darling Hammond and her colleagues. Um, this reflects over 30 years of research by multiple investigators. The point um, in the second bullet is what we really want to highlight the most is professional development is only effective if it results in change, in a change in teaching practice and student learning outcomes. And down below on this slide, I think you may get this, I'm not sure, but if you don't, 
um, this link will go to the link of a lot of the work that we reflected on in developing this document. Can you go to the next one, please? So in doing this work, as you walk, walk through the uh, professional development guidance document, at the beginning, we talked a lot about the research. And then we asked, we kind of brainstormed these questions, these essential questions for you to consider. It starts with, is professional development choices based on recent data and a top priority to creating lasting change in your schools? And this is really important to make sure that you really are choosing your PD on your data and your top priority because your limited time and capacity in your schools, we recognize is a challenge. So trying to do focus, have, um, have your focus be on your top priority is the best choice. The next one on how to apply to student learning, that conversation, my assumption will happen as you're, you're um, discussing the first bullet. The next bullet though, um, I'll talk a little bit more about this or show some um, information on this, but how are you gonna measure the impacts of this PD on teacher practice and student learning? And um, cause that's something we don't always do. We don't evaluate how well it went. We do it and then it's done. The next bullet, it the role of the administrator, why we ask that is if the administrator is the support person who's supervising staff, they need to understand what the staff's going, what they're trying to learn. So we'd like you to really consider your role as an administrator on this. And the last one is we just, it's a catch all and really more focused to your needs. You know, what questions will guide your team in making decisions within your strategic plan? Can we go to the next slide, please? So one piece I know I learned early on in my learnings back in the nineties, that dates me, and when I took staff development was really around the characteristics of adult learners. And what this list, I'd like you to take a look at it and um, either in the chat or let's, let's start in the chat, um, put in the chat, which one or one that resonates with you, motivation, readiness, experience, self-direction or um, orientation. So I'm seeing a lot of different ones. Motivation, readiness seems to pop up a lot. but I actually almost see all of them popping up. So that's interesting. Does anyone um, care to share out their choice or a piece of PD that they felt um, aligns to their choice? Especially the, you know, that you took into consideration when making the choice of PD of your staff? Kim, I'm happy to jump in if you if you'd like. This is Jen McKay over at Dyke Nolan Bath. Sure, Jen. Um, I put orientation because I think, you know, working with with teachers for quite a few years now, PD that doesn't give learners a chance to actually do the work while they have the coaches or the you know professional development presenters on hand is very difficult for many staff to then take back and actually go do. If you just hear about it, 
or see someone else kind of talk about it and you don't get a chance to implement it with with some guidance while you're implementing it, I'm not sure it always sticks as well. Thanks, Jen. And you know, that goes with any learning opportunity, whether it's your, your students, an adult, and even in your own personal life as you you need to actually apply your learning to really solidify it and so that you can transfer it. Okay, I know we all, time is an essence here. So wait a minute, I have to go from one screen to the other myself. Um, can we move to the next slide, please? Oh, and actually on that slide, just uh, there was a, you, um, a link to where we um, were able to lift this actual um, graphic, I guess, of these adult characteristics. So this slide talks about the seven critical elements of um, PD, and they, this, this um, mostly comes from Linda Darling Hammond. She lists these in that um, link that I that was in a, a previous slide. But this list of critical elements is um, what we have taken these this list of critical elements and we um, put it in a chart that I'll share in a couple more slides to help you as you're looking at PD and trying to figure out which one, one of these or a couple of these critical elements you're addressing when you're selecting your PD. Um, is there any questions or experiences related to any of these elements that you'd like to share out? Typically, PD is always content focused. It should incorporate active learning, just as reflect, going back to what Jen just um, talked about. It should support collaboration. The days of doing PD in isolation, we know doesn't work well. Um, we should use effective, it should be model effective practices provide coaching and that's why the role of the administrator is so important or if you're lucky to have content or instructional coaches to support staff it should offer feedback and reflection and most important it should be sustainable um, you want to pick things that if you leave as a principal that is still going to be happening in your schools Can we go to the next slide, please? So as I said earlier, I was going to touch upon more about evaluating professional development. This recommendation reflects right here, these um, bullets here from Thomas Guskey's five critical levels of professional development. And it includes um, other researchers um, also, as we as we reviewed the research, um, it's important to recognize that this is a list that is hierarchically arranged. But so, in doing so, make sure that the last two are part of your um, evaluation process, um, along with just positive student learning, positive participation reaction, measuring the impact, but is it sustained through organizational change, that deeper change? And is the knowledge and skills um, being imp totally implemented? I know I was in a my one of my school's meetings and that was an issue with them that not everyone was implementing and how to go about that. And, um, and that's a common dilemma for schools to, to address. 
So can we go to the next slide? In doing so, I mean, we had one example from Jen on, um, or a little example about the reasonings for PD, but here's some examples that we as coaches just brainstormed that we see happening in our schools. Um, some questions that are not always considered for these examples, can you link adult learning characteristic to that, to an example? And for instance, can a book study be self-directed, allowing teachers to read a book at their own pace and share it in a way that meets how they learn? Um, those are some questions around an example of a book study, the first one. And so the example, choose a book that is research-based, such as in the science of reading, and then create a way to share your learning. Having, you know, providing this for your, your teachers, especially for those to make, if you go back to the adult learning chart to make it more meaningful for them. And um, these are things we'd like you to consider because as you know, your staff won't engage full-heartedly if it's not meaningful to them. And then the last slide for me anyways, is the chart that I was talking about. And what you'll recognize in this chart is, um, the components that were in a previous slide around professional development. And we just designed this just, you know, it's it's not an expectation you're all gonna use this chart for every little bit of PD you choose, but it, it will help illuminate these needs of effective PD and allow you to decide, am I um, meeting some of these in the selection? Um, can you think, can you, is anyone willing to share a PD offering that they feel that they had about five of these um, components or, or critical elements in choosing their PD? I don't mind jumping in again. Um, our district offered a social emotional kind of choose your own adventure PD day at one point. Um, it aligned with our strategic plan because we were recognizing increasing social emotional and behavioral support needs due to trauma impacted populations. Um, it was content focused around SEL curriculum, but also kind of implementing strategies in the classroom. Uh, some of the workshops actually had people using the tools and trying out the approaches hands-on. People were in work working teams, so it was collaborative. Um, and we actually had a brain-based expert present and then people in the disciplines across the district that work specifically on social emotional learning were running the different workshops. So there was some effective practice that was being modeled. Um, and I think that's five things. <laughs> that's, <Right> on. <laughs> that's quite a few. I wasn't actually counting, but I was, I just loved how you explained um, the areas that you were aligning to. And um, yeah, and I think many of you when you really sit down and reflect on your choices, um, obviously as a tier three school, it needs to align to your strategic plan. Content focus is typically always the number one, and we are trying to make our learning more active and not passive. And we're trying to get, and in doing that, it tends to be collaborative. We want it to be effective practice. It's almost like you can tick off almost every box when you really think about it. And um, so anyways, this tool was really designed just to help you if you choose to use it or not. It's part of the uh, document, which I'm not totally sure when that will be revealed to you all, probably pretty soon after this meeting. Uh, Kim, I actually put the link in the chat. So Oh, good, good. Yeah. 
Thanks. So um, our apologies, we tried to make it a two pager. It did uh, run over a little bit, but I think when you have time and you can really read through it, I think there'll be a lot of um, helpful information within that document. So with that said, I'm gonna move it over, pass it over to Amy. Next slide, please, Monique. So we link these two together. Oh, hello, I'm Amy Peterson Roper and um, I uh, have been with the department as a coach for, this is my eighth year. Um, before that, I was a principal at in Ellsworth, in Ellsworth Elementary Middle School. Um, and so um, we have noticed for the you know past few years, particularly the last couple of years, as our main model of school support has become more focused and with feedback from the USDOE that we needed to really start to provide some guidance and particularly guidance documents uh, to support you as you are making this decision around how you're gonna use your federal funding. And so we link these two together because really um, professional development and external consultants sometimes gets muddy. You know, what is, when you're thinking about having somebody come in to work with you in um, Amplify, and is that a is that an external consultant or is that professional development? So we're hoping this will help it become more clearer than mud. And our 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 hope is you can take these um, documents and although they are, have great samples, we think um, they are just samples to make sure that you are following statute and what federal funding can be used for. So what's the difference, you know, the training versus technical assistance? Um, they, they, it's a common way for uh, schools to um, intermix the two, but what we're gonna talk about now is external consultant. Somebody that you want to have to come in to work shoulder to shoulder with um, your staff or um, with the leadership team. And I want you to note that, um, that it's really important that you, whatever you're doing with your external um, consultant, that you are looking at that professional development piece, that it's data-driven, evidence-based, and aligned with your strategic plan. Those are the three most important pieces to remember as we work through this. Uh, next slide, please. And so uh, I'm just going to reiterate uh, again, sorry, I kind of checked off. So the, it's the statute says that the schools need to have a review process to recruit, screen, select, and evaluate any external partner that's coming in to work with you. And you also need to uh, make sure that you have gone through your policies, your procurement policy, your hiring policy, your staff development policy, to be sure that you're working within the realms of your school district as well. Next slide, please. And so what we have provided, and you have it in the link, is sort of a way to keep it all together. But this is the kind of documentation that you should be keeping at your school and that Monique will ask you to show proof of, that you, it supports the goal of your grant, um, that you followed the policies, that you followed a recruitment, um, screening, hiring, contract, that you have a narrative that shows how this came to be, that both the superintendent and the principal have signed and the contract is signed for both the superintendent and the principal. Next slide. And so what I did, um, so I have had the privilege for a couple of years of trying to figure this out um, with different schools. So rather than ask you, and thank you, Jen McKay for jumping in, I have pre-asked people to sort of talk about their pieces in the work. And um, and then they, after they're done presenting their piece, they will ask if you have any questions. So please, this is going to be an interactive part. So if you have questions um, at the end of their presentation, just go ahead and ask. 
So the first person I asked to start off, and again, this is in that sample document that you got around external PD, is Alyssa Stevens. So Alyssa, you're on. Hello, everyone. Um, we like to call it voluntold. Um, <laughs> Come on now. I was happy to share. <laughs> um, so in the past, we've done a lot of focus in our district on math. Um, and we're finally starting to see kind of the results of all of the focus we've put on math. Um, and with the way the world works, we also um, had a new ELA coach starting this year. Um, so we thought it would be a good time to kind of shift our focus. Um, every year we do a staff survey. So evidence um, from the staff survey was we feel good about math. We're um, lacking some consistency in ELA. Um, we knew our non-negotiables were, it needed to be uh, somebody who was um, really up with science and reading, um, someone with a lot of PD experience um, working in person. Um, we're in Washington County, which is pretty remote. Um, so finding somebody who could provide consistent um, in a hybrid in-person uh, virtual um, format was really important to us. That in-person piece um, was was important to us. Uh, and it kind of um, worked out. We, um, Amy had by chance met somebody, passed the information along to me um, and the ELA coach and I um, met with them first. Um, and then we met with our whole leadership team. Um, she provided her credentials. We had um, her resume. Um, she talked about her history. She's worked um, and done a very similar cons consultancy, um, mostly virtually, but at another school in Klamath Falls um, on the other side of the United States. Um, and they, I even spoke to the principal or curriculum coordinator um, that they had worked with to kind of get some feedback as well. Uh, and we used this document um, in our process in terms of ensuring that we were on the right track in terms of hearing um, the questions that we asked. We're, we're getting the information that we needed and that we made sure it was continued um, work toward our strategic plan um, and that it would be a good opportunity. Like I said, this was our first year with this new ELA coach. Um, so it would be a train the trainer in terms of um, having that coach get the support that she needed so that this could be um, sustained from years to come, um, if in the event in the future we don't have this consultancy, um, that the goal is is a fade out, um, so that we we have our our expert trains to create new experts um, in in the area of science and reading and teacher pedagogy. Um, I included our school board every step of the way. Um, we our school board takes July off, but at our first meeting in August, um, talked about how we were. In the planning process, um, our superintendent was on board um, and just kept them informed of that this was going to be an ongoing thing. Um, and I think I hit upon um, if anybody has any questions. Seeing that there's none, next slide, please. And it continues with Alyssa. Yeah, so another part was ensuring that we had policies that matched. Um, so our expense authorization and reimbursement, um, our procurement, um, making sure those district policies, we were following those as well. Um, so in our district, if you're spending over um, $5,000, you need to have, even though it's not local funds, um, we still need to have school board on board um, or at least the superintendent signature. Um, and instead of one or the other, I just ensured that everybody was on the on the same page um, in the event that if we don't have tier three funds, if we were to decide to continue, I wanted to make sure the school board knew that this work was important. So in the future, if this would to come out of our local budget, that they they saw the value um, and that that could continue. Does anybody have any questions around policies? They can be tricky.
And if you have a difficult time, if you're looking for an external consultant and you're having a difficult time thinking about those policies, um, I know that Monique can also support you in sort of saying, look in this area to be able to um, support this work. And those policies, when you are um, uploading everything into the grant should also be uploaded into the grant. So you have them listed here in your, um, in your sort of documentation, but also the policies. Next slide. So we just went through, and this slide is um, small, I'm sorry, but we just went through sort of like, okay, we're, this is what we're, our, our uh, root cause is saying that we should really focus on. This is our goal. This is one of the strategies we're gonna do. And I've asked Ashley Reynolds to talk about how they went through the process of, um, this is another external um, person that they're using. So Ashley is from Belfast. Go ahead, Ashley. Thank you. Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, Alyssa, it was really interesting to hear your journey because we had some some parallels, but not um, completely. So the school um, that I'm a principal at has a 35% identified special education population. Um, and so that challenge is reflected in our data in lots of different ways and something that we really wanted to focus on in our strategic plan. Um, and as a school district this year, we K-8 are exploring the Amplify reading curriculum, but when we brought the um, school team leaders together, um, which is a group of, of seven, including the assistant principal and myself, one of the things that they really teased out um, as a barrier was the special education teachers um, access to amplify training and the, the role of push in versus pull out. And there was a lot of discussion there and they said, wow, this really feels like um, a resource inequity and something that we could address through um, an outside consultant. So um, coming back to what Todd said, I, I liked what he said about um, finding someone who they have a trusting relationship with. That was huge, asking the leadership team, like, what qualities are you looking for in, in an external consultant? And something um, that they said was when you're recruiting and you're interviewing, we want someone who has walked this walk um, recently. We want someone who not only has great science of reading background and understanding, but someone who has a sense of, of rural Maine educator um, and special ed, or ed educator practice in the last 10 years. So that's really important to them um, because they felt like buy-in from staff was a critical component in the, in the con consultant model. And they wanted someone that would be willing to come, someone that was willing to come in person on a monthly basis to do planning with them. They, they wanted to step back from the online piece. Um, so that was part of the recruitment process as we were screening applicants. Part of the interview process was asking the person who we were interested in to come up with a pre-survey that she would give to special educators to get a baseline understanding, not just of what they knew about certain pedagogies and the science of reading, um, but what they wanted to get out of the, the consultant model, what would be valuable to them and how we could measure that in our strategic plan. So that was a huge piece of, of understanding if the person would be a good fit for us. And that, that piece has happened, and we also will have a post survey that's similar to assess growth and effectiveness of the model once um, the year is completed. Does anybody have any questions for Ashley around sort of that recruitment? I think Alyssa and Ashley did an excellent job sort of bringing through fruition, sort of threading the needle of this is what we, this is what we found, this is what we need, this is what we need you to do, and can you do it? Next slide, Ash, um, please, Monique. And so, um, so I mentioned about the narrative, and um, I'm going to go back to Alyssa. This, this is sort of her meeting notes that uh, went around with the narrative that she did. And you can all just take a look at them, read them yourself. And then if you have any questions, uh, Alyssa, I'm sure, can come on and read them.
Any questions around this? Again, some of you may have already done your strategic plan and have done it differently than what we're talking about. But again, the narrative of just making sure you have something in there that kind of talks about your process so that you can meet that statute of recruitment. Seeing no questions, next slide. And we talked about both signatures being uploaded and on, and again, uh, this is just a sample from that form that your superintendent signature is there and your principal signature is there. And really um, what we talked about in the, in the professional development and we're talking about here as well is the evaluation. No matter if it's a professional development opportunity or a consultant opportunity, both should be evaluated. And um, I'm gonna ask the next slide, please. I think it's the next slide. Oops, oh wait. So this is just your next steps. Sign the document, keep the document, document documentation, upload the checklist and the contract or your narrative and the contract, and then create an evaluation and plan to fill that out at the end of your contract and upload at the end of the year. And I've asked Freddie, uh, Lazo, do please, he works at Mount Jefferson Junior High, to sort of talk about that process because he and I worked on something all last year, sort of trying to figure out documentation. So the next slide, please. And I'm gonna let Freddie go ahead, go ahead and talk. Hello, everybody, good morning. <clears throat> um, I just wanna give a shout out to Amy. I don't think the coaches in uh, their roles get enough praise and acknowledgement for all they do. So everybody on this screen is a tier three identified school and you know the value that they bring to your teams. Um, so my little portion this morning is that we are identified in math and um, very similar. I echo what Alyssa said. I echo what the other said about trying to find that consultant that's going to mesh well with your teams that is going to bring something to the table and move the plan that your leadership team has uh, come up with. So our team had a plan and um, what we needed was that that like bridge between the work that we do every single day as educators and every day brings new new fun and exciting things and what we needed was that person to say hey make sure you're doing this hey make sure you're doing this hey make sure you're on track hey make sure you're doing this because if you don't have that person then you will only talk about these things the next time you meet there has to be work that's done in between meetings if the plan is going to work and the plan is going to roll out the way it's supposed to so our consultant, her name is Shelly Simpson. Um, very similarly, she was very highly uh, recommended. Um, we did the whole vetting process and she is wonderful. Um, so don't look her up because I think she's on her way out um, and <laughs> she's with us one more year. Um, and we hope to hit the ground running this year and we um, already have. So at the end of last year, we had a plan, our team, um, and we just needed again, the push in the right direction. So when we evaluated uh, Shelly's service from last year, it was a yes in every single category. And the amount of work that I can now reflect on that was done and the proof of the work that was done is incredible. Um, so the first one there is teaching and training teachers on data. Um, I think as a whole, as educators, we know what data is and what it can provide for us but it's that whole calibration of every teacher knowing what information they're looking at and what that's saying to them. And as a school, what information are we looking at and calibrating on? So uh, one of the things that we did uh, in the beginning of last year was calibrate the three pieces of evidences that we were gonna use as a district, period. Um, above and beyond that, classroom teachers can use whatever they want in their classrooms to make more um, classroom observations with their students and assess their students. Um, so that was a big part of, of that. Um, we had we had a presentation on uh, the NWA reports. As you all know, there are some reports now that are going to be archived. So we are going to do another refresher this year to make sure that we're calibrating and looking at the similar reports. The other thing that we did a lot of last year was the uh, training our staff on tiered intervention. This was for us, and I'm gonna speak about my district in, in, in just make it personal to us. And I don't know uh, where you all are in your journey, but I know that in my district, staff had a different opinion of what tier one was, tier two and tier three. And we did not have a school-wide 
a district-wide system of vetting our students with the data and the services that they were getting. Um, the only system that we, that we had district-wide is special ed, but special ed is outside of what we're now doing with MTSS. So that was huge for us to calibrate where we are and talk about what tier one was. What is tier one? And tier one is everything that happens inside the classroom. And what was amazing about that is because we don't have a district-wide or a school-wide um, system like MTSS, which we are now gonna roll out this year, full implementation this year, is that teachers are doing a lot of interventions with their kids right now. Um, and one of the things that is hard to understand from a teacher's perspective is that whatever they are doing right now was teacher driven, it wasn't team driven. So now when we have meetings regarding MTSS, this is gonna be a team approach. And then we can talk about things that are tried, the progress monitoring that's been done and the progress the students are making. So um, that was a huge PD and a huge calibration for us was that uh, tiered instruction piece. The other piece that the consultant uh, helped us do was co-plan our next steps. Um, we knew where we wanted to go, but again, knowing someone that's been there and done that and kind of has had their hand in this type of work for a long time was hugely, hugely beneficial. And then the last piece is, you know, wh what is the product, right? So you have to provide a product to prove that this work was going somewhere and, and doing something with it. Last year, we, it was a big um, um, development for us last year. We created so many documents um, starting from what is our vision for MTSS? That was huge. We spent a lot of time on that. From there, we needed to identify what our protocols were going to be. Uh, we needed to talk about the roles and responsibilities. We created a document for that. Um, we also looked at what well, core one intervention, we created a checklist for our staff. So they had that. Then there was another document that went beyond just the core one interventions. We called that the layered support with the definitions so that talked about tier two and tier three. Um, from there, now we start talking about what is it going to look like for MTSS and teachers referring kids to, our, to MTSS. So with that comes a referral form. With that comes a parent letter. Um, with that comes the IOP, the Individualized Learning Plan for the students. Uh, with that comes a, a case manager checklist. There's just a lot that goes into this whole um, process. And then from there is once an IOP, IOP is developed, we also created a progress monitoring tool. Um, if there isn't a unified universal progress monitoring tool, teachers have to create that. And one teacher's tool could be different from another teacher's tool. And then, you know, how do those tools kind of align? That could be another issue. So we created a universal tool when a student is in MTSS um, to make that much more clear uh, for all of us when we're looking at data over time. And then with all that comes, just like anything in education, comes a lot of jargon, a lot of new terms, a lot of new um, definitions. So we created our MTSS glossary that defines all these new terms and things like that so we can calibrate and all speak the same language. So for us, when we went back and looked at this evaluation of service, um, it was almost reflecting on the year and reflecting on all the work that we've done. And again, last year was, was a lot of lifting. So. Um, it was a yes for all the categories, and um, and then obviously, Mr. Mr. Our superintendent, he has to look at this information as well. And I, I always, I'm a very collaborative leader, and I don't believe I know it all, and and I don't know it all, and that's part of why I'm very collaborative. <laughs> is in the superintendent was always involved in every step. Our school board was updated along the way, and our team members um, was part of the process the whole way through. So. Um, and we're going to continue the work this year, and we hope that we can, uh, again, get full implementation this year. Thank you, Freddie. And you know what I really saw when you were talking about this is you never said she did, she did. It was we did, we did. And I think that goes back to those um, seven critical elements, as well as the adult learner, that people were motivated, that they were oriented to the work. Um, you know, really great job. Um, any questions for Freddie? So just before we moved on, so we've had three schools and there's, I know there's many other schools. It's just that I, because I was facilitating this uh, information, I use schools from uh, the ones that I uh, help support. 
One is really sp focused on special education and reading. One is really focused on um, best teaching strategies and supporting the literacy coach in uh, ensuring that that happens. And one is really focused on MTSS. So there is a variety of ways that you and, and people you can use for external consulting. It, the most important piece though, is that they you, that you are able to put it all into this um, sort of narrative of the pieces that the statute and the grant uh, want you to do. Next slide, please. That is the end for me and for Kim uh, for the two documents that we shared today. Of course, here are your uh, support people at the department, but your first um, your first piece of support that you can get is from your coach. And if your coach doesn't have the answer and can't support you there, then uh, you know we'll direct you to say, hey, you know, but we're the first person in line, so don't forget to use us. And particularly when you are thinking through, or your SLT team, you're thinking through, we need a little bit more support um, because we have a lot of networks out there. We, um, we don't say, oh, you should use this person. What we say is, we've heard that this has been a great um, thing, or we've met somebody that might. We connect you and then we step away. And that work goes along through the strategic plan and your SLT and where you're sort of monitoring, but we are not the people who are going to say, oh, you know, this is the right, this is the right fit. The right fit belongs to your team. Next slide. 